Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there. This is Dee, and welcome to episode 14 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Thanks for coming back. Or, if you are new, thanks for visiting us for the first time. I hope you like what you hear. You know, it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now, 24 degrees Celsius. I'm here in beautiful Colorado, and I'm in the basement recording this podcast. <laughs> I gotta get a life. You know, actually... Actually, there's more to it than that. I'm, I choose to be down here. Even, I know, on a day like today, I'm choosing to be down here. You know, I, I'm sure my wife and I will get out for a beautiful walk later this evening. We really enjoy taking an evening stroll along the path behind our house or, you know, through the neighborhood and, and saying hi to the neighbors. It's one of the things I did as much as I could during my withdrawal, and I try to do even more so now. It gives us the exercise. It gets us outside, see some nature. Just a lot of value in, in all those things that really helps helps in recovery. But for right now, I'd rather be right here in the basement talking with you. Is that screwed up? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I was trading emails with a listener over the past couple of days who is feeling very isolated. She shared with me how alone she felt. And my, God, my heart just saddened and sank. When I heard those words, I tried to tell her she's not alone and that she has tons of friends uh, in the Benzo community. And I'm just one of them. And, and I don't say that without sincerity. Many of you who I've been corresponding with via email have become my friends. I, I honestly feel closer to you than to many others in my personal life. I, th I think it's because we share this bond, this similar life-altering experience that we've all been through or are going through. And it's, it's a bond that makes us instantly close. You know, it gets past the superficial crap. You know, that, that stuff when you, when you meet a neighbor or you meet a, a friend that somebody introduces you to and you talk about the weather and, you know, the news and this kind of stuff. And we never really talk about the real stuff. You know, it's just not something we do when we first meet people. But here in Benza Withdrawal, we don't have time for that crap. It's just not important to us anymore because there's so many other things going on in our lives. We care about really connecting. You know, <laughs> I have this wish. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, but I wish I had this commune, okay? Yes, I still have a bunch of 60s, 70s love child in me. I'm sorry. I grew up somewhat in the 70s, and I just still have that essence. But I wish I had a commune, something on a bunch of land with some cabins and a mountain stream, you know, somewhere up in the Rocky Mountains, where anyone struggling with benzodependence and withdrawal could come and stay as long as they needed. I, I just think that would be amazing. That, that's my wish. And you know what? Maybe, maybe one day that'll happen. I, 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 it's possible. It's possible. But then again, I guess there's even a better dream, and that is having the, the day one day when that's not needed <laughs> because nobody is dependent on benzos anymore. But, you know, I still wish I had the commune so we could still come together and hang out or at least have an annual reunion or something. But this connection that we all feel... I think that we all feel with each other that has brought us together is universal and it's global. And it's something of value. It's one of those pluses that's come from this experience. There are good things 
that have come from this experience, and this is just one. And sometimes we have to focus on those and try to remember those, or know those are coming when we're the, in the middle of this, of this crazy time. Today's format will follow the usual track, except we're going to skip our Spotlight and Benzo story section just for this episode due to time. We will be hearing Jennifer's story in the interview, and we'll also touch on a short Benzo story in our mailbag section. So, so today we're going to have our intro, mailbag, news, and feature. Our feature today is an amazing interview with Jennifer Lee, who is both a Benzo survivor and she holds a doctorate in psychology. It's a great interview, and I think you're going to want to stick around for this one. That's our format. And of course, as always, I need your feedback. You can comment on this episode, visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback, or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. The Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you're listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This helps new listeners find us. Okay, let's move on to our mailbag section. I'm going to keep it to one question again today, just for time. And this one is from Holly in South Dakota, the USA. Holly shares a bit of her story with the question kind of tucked inside, but it's a real short story. Hopefully she'll share her entire full story with us later. Holly writes, I'm enjoying listening to your podcasts. If I had only seen these months ago when I started on this hellacious journey. My story is probably like all others. I was prescribed Ativan for health-related anxiety. After taking it daily for two years, I started to develop agoraphobia. I'm 10 months off now and still can't be in public. Well, I can and do, but it's extremely uncomfortable. I was an RN working full-time and now not able to be places too long. I'm not anxious per se, but going out, it's what I call a complete sensory overload. Instantly, when I'm in a store, the lights hit my brain and I become irritable, overwhelmed, brain buzzing. I'm so scared this is permanent. I want my old life back. Have you or anyone you know had this symptom for this long? Thank you, Holly. And I really look forward to hearing your story in detail when you're ready to share. Yes, many have had the same symptoms as you're describing, and for as long and if not longer. Many of us have symptoms into our fourth and fifth year and sixth year, and it doesn't really matter the symptom. It varies for each person. Our senses are so overwhelmed during withdrawal. Hyper excitability of the senses, especially vision and hearing, are very common. Please keep telling yourself that these are not permanent. Those of us who have been through it can tell you we felt the same way as you did when we were in the middle of it. And we have fully healed or at least mostly healed. Like myself, who's still in protracted withdrawal, I'm still healing, but I've made amazing progress, and I'm doing so much better than I was. And I'm happy, and I'm doing well now. This is fear talking. Your brain is trapped in a fearful state, and far too often. Logic, rationality, these things can't get through. So... Find ways to ease your fear and anxiety. I've mentioned this before, but there are plenty of these to work on. And find what fits you. And keep telling yourself that this is temporary. It does take a long time. I know that. And 10 months seems forever when you're in the middle of this. But it does get better. And I can't tell you if that's going to start at month 11 or month 20. I don't know. But if you try to reduce the anxiety and you try to find ways to relax and calm, your symptoms will get better as you do that. But as for the healing, it just takes time. Remember, you're doing great. You are doing an awesome job during this time. This is a horrendous time for anybody. And the fact that you're reaching out and trying to get help and talking to other people tells me that you're doing the right thing. You're looking for help, and you're getting through this. You're going to be fine. Thanks for writing us, Holly. I appreciate the question. 
And that's it for our mailbag. Let's move on to our Benzo news. Here are the highlights from last week. On Monday, April 8th, Benzodiazepine Information Coalition provided a full PDF version of the Ashton Manual on their website. This is great. <laughs> and this is with full permission of the respected parties. So please go check that out. On Tuesday, April 9th, the Benzo Free Facebook page reached 2,500 likes and follows. And we want to thank everyone who helped us to reach this milestone. On Wednesday, April 10th, we released episode 13 of the Benzo Free podcast, which was titled Benzo Bad Guys, Anger, Aggression, Depression, and Obsession. On Thursday, April 11th, we reposted a blog post from the Inner Compass Initiative regarding anger and rage, which was a great follow-up to our podcast on that same subject. Also on Thursday, we reposted an article from WBAD on the accuracy of tablet splitting and liquid dosing, which affects most of us who are trying to taper. And on Saturday, April 13th, we reposted another blog post from the Inner Compass Initiative, which provided a long list of coping techniques for withdrawal. And that wrapped up the week. Please, if you know of any other great articles or news that you would like us to cover, please tell us. We're always looking for news about Benzo's dependence and recovery. And that brings us to our feature. For today's feature, I have a wonderful interview with Jennifer Lee. Jennifer was so kind to take her time to talk with us. I recorded this interview with her this past Saturday, April 13th. Let me tell you a bit about her. Jennifer earned her doctorate in psychology in 2007 and became a leading authority on parenting teen girls. She was invited to be on radio and television and was interviewed by top-tier media for her work. In 2010, her career came to a halt when she began tapering off the benzodiazepine she had taken as prescribed. What followed was a nightmare. Lost in the medically unrecognized benzo withdrawal syndrome, she suffered grueling physical and mental symptoms for years until her brain and nervous system repaired itself from the damage the medication had caused. Jennifer has dedicated herself to helping others navigate the frightening and exhausting journey of getting benzo free and healing. She coaches, blogs, and teaches workshops on various topics regarding recovery. You can learn more about Jennifer on her website at benzowithdrawalhelp.com. Let's join the interview. Hello, Jennifer, and welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with our listeners today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dee, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I thought maybe we'd start off just real quickly with your own personal experience with benzos, if that's okay. Sure. Let's see. The very first time I was put on a benzo, I was 21, and I had major back surgery. I had scoliosis that was corrected, so I had two steel rods, Harrington rods put in my back and I was in a body cast for seven months and I was put on Valium, Percocet and Somas okay. and I can't remember how long I stayed on them but they cold turkeyed me off of them when they thought you know I no longer needed them and I remember thinking that I had had a nervous breakdown I really didn't understand what was happening to me and of course nobody nobody else knew either I just thought I started developing panic and I didn't know what was going on right so, you know, eventually my life became my own again, and I got past that, and I just thought it was a little blip in the road of, of human development. And <laughs> then fast forward to my mid-30s, I was going through a very nasty divorce, and I had lived through the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, I had been in, hospitalized for observation. I was pregnant with twins. I had a two-year-old and a three-year-old at home, and I was in the hospital in San Francisco with twins under observation, and the earthquake hit. And oh, wow. needless to say, I suffered severe PTSD. The twins were delivered shortly thereafter. And right after they were born, I, for some reason, they were kind of like pulling the finger out of out of the dam, and I started being unable to no longer ignore my sexual abuse history as a little girl. And so it was just this cascade of events that I just fell apart going through this horrific divorce and having terrible panic attacks and mm -hmm. went and saw a psychiatrist and he told me I had a bad brain and that <laughs> I needed, I need, yeah, right. I needed a benzo just like a diabetic needs their insulin. I'm sure many of us have heard this 
this uh, analogy. And I stayed on the drug, took it as prescribed, I think, for about 18 years. And and, and which drug was that you were on this time? Clonazepam. And uh, towards the end, I'd say the last few years before I got off, I was in tolerance, would go to neurologists, mm -hmm. go to interns. Nobody could tell me what was wrong with me. Um, and I began drinking quite a bit okay. at night because that kind of staved off that horrible chemical, you know, anxiety and stuff. Uh, and I decided I was just getting so sick between the benzo and the alcohol. Um, I just decided to go to AA. And a week later, after I stopped drinking, I decided, well, I don't need this pill anymore. This is, you know, silly to be taking this. And my doctor said, just cut it in quarters. You'll be off in a month. And I was able to cut out a half of a milligram okay. in a, you know, just like two weeks. And you and I both know how, yeah, <laughs> yeah how dev well, everybody in the community knows how devastating that would be. You know, uh, that was October 2010. And um, tapered down, was bedridden, very sick. Another quote unquote benzo expert. Uh, told me taper back up until I got more stable, then I could go back <laughs> down again, right? I know. Yeah. So tapered up to 0.9, started to taper back down and could only get just a small way down. And I was even more sick than I was down at 0.325 and, and bedridden. And so I saw another quote unquote benzo expert. And he said, well, I'm just going to give you some phenobarbital and you can detox at home. You'll be fine. You'll be fine in a couple of days. You're on such, he says, you're on such a low dose. It's, you know, that's, and right. the gates of hell opened up and swallowed me for wow. a very, very, very long time. It was a very brutal recovery. Yeah, I imagine. So that's my history in a nutshell. It would be a professional training, actually a doctorate in psychology. Did this come in to help you with your recovery? Did, did your experience and your training <laughs> help you at all? I'm sorry. I'm kind of chuckling over okay. here. Um, I have to be honest and say no, not really. Okay. Um, benzo, with, as you know... It just takes the prefrontal cortex. That's our rational, logical, life and loving, affirming, right. decision making part of the brain. It just takes it offline. So you're living in your limbic system, the threat detection, the fear. I could not think rationally or normally. It was just survive. I was just trying to survive. So I couldn't use any any of my tools. I couldn't even use my faith. Uh, there was really nothing. I felt like I had been eviscerated of everything that was Jennifer, everything that was Jennifer, personality, education, cognitive abilities, imagination, creativity, sexual, my libido, everything that made me me was gone. That sounds awfully familiar to me too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know it's so hard to explain that to other people that your brain has been hijacked. And it's just not behaving the way it used to. And it, it's so reactionary. And people can understand that at that state, that every little thing, whether it's a sound or a trigger or a food or something, just sends you flying. And Absolutely. It's, it's yes, crazy. we no longer, it is crazy, D. We no longer live in reality. We are living right. in, you know, some... I don't know. We're in the this <laughs> we're in the inner circle of hell for a long time. <laughs> so you 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 run um a website. It's at benzowithdrawalsupport dot com. Is that right? Benzowithdrawalhelp.com. I'm sorry, benzowithdrawalhelp.com. Mm -hmm. I don't have my note on that one. I was trying to pull it from my brain. I apologize. No, oh, no worries. No um, worries. Is this your full time work now or do you also do other work? This right now is mostly my full time work. Oh good. That's great. I, I was really impressed with your site, I must say. I went and checked it out in detail and read several of your blog posts. And you work with faith, you work with um, acceptance, um, your teachings on compassion, all these things that you encompass are things that I didn't have going in, but I learned during were very helpful. Oh, absolutely. You said that at first you kind of lost your faith and you lost a little bit coming into it, but did you find getting those back helped? Um, and finding acceptance helped, and that's what helped you get through it towards the end, the latter stages? Yes. In fact, my faith really matured. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to leave a lot of uh, dogma that, you know, that's entrenched in religion. Interesting. And, and I felt like my heart opened up to God in a way that was so personal 
and so freeing and so deep and so loving. I truly finally felt loved by God, but I had to walk away from all the church, you know, black and white, you know, rules and regulations and, and, and all the beliefs. And I, I started actually started following a, a, a wonderful daily meditation from uh, Father Rohr. It's okay. I think the center for action and contemplation. And he, he has this, more encompassing view of of Christ and God and that has helped me a great deal a great deal really helped me stop being a drama queen i think i had been uh-huh. so driven by my trauma my abuse growing up mm-hmm. that the whole world revolved around me and how i was feeling and um <laughs> i wanted to control people places and things and it really allowed me to step Aside from my ego, more often than not, I still have one, I still struggle, but I guess I'm still human, but it allowed me to step outside of that and to truly realize that we are all one, we're all in this creation together, and I am now able to love and reach out to people and feel compassion and empathy in a way that I have never been able to feel before. And it just gives me great joy to just be a part of the creation without having to be so run by my ego about what I want people, places, and things to be like and to do. I'm truly able now to accept life on life's terms. And that is the key to having so much more peace in your life. That is so wonderful. I I love hearing that. And that's the letting go of the ego has been a struggle for me, but this podcast has helped a lot. I think hearing everybody's stories and having people reach out to me has actually helped me focus more on helping and less on me. But as we all know, in the middle of benzo withdrawal, control is a huge thing. Um, you have talked yes. in some of your blog posts about, you know, needing to control everything and needing to find that, that, you know, that center, but also that you need to find a way to have acceptance and have patience and, and allow the natural healing process to take place. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Well, I found what first kind of the steps that I made in that direction, I spent a lot of time asking why. Why me? Why, you know, why did I have to get so damaged by the drug? You know, I've been a good person, blah, blah, blah. I was really angry at God. Yeah. And then finally, I realized that the answer was not in the why question. And I had to start asking different questions. And that, I think, like I said, was the start for me. And so I began to ask what and how. What can I do today, God, to serve you, to serve others, to, you know, to be a good person, to get through this? How do I do that? What does that look like? And when I stopped focusing on the why and started thinking about the what and the how, I was able to move forward more because that put me over into the solution. The why kept me stuck in the problem. And I just began to start every day asking that and asking that throughout the day. And then I stopped focusing so much on all the symptoms and I would ask myself, what's the most loving thing to think, feel, or do? Mm -hmm. And I still do that all throughout the day to to guide my next decision or, you know, what I'm going to do. And I found that when I focus on what was the most loving thing to do, I was able I was able to accept a lot of all the nonsense and benzo withdrawal that was going yeah. on. I could kind of rise above it. Does that make sense, Steve? It totally does. And again, I, it's almost like, you know, preaching to the choir here. It's so funny to hear you say similar things that, you know, I'd uncovered and, and some new things too. And I really value what you're saying. I am curious too. I noticed your faith was so important to you, but also I know several people and some of our listeners are more secular and may not have that foundation. What do you tell people who come to you who may not have faith in a supreme being, but are still looking to find that that centering type of of help? You know, having faith in something greater than yourself isn't a prerequisite to being one of my coaching clients or joining any of my workshops. I just tell people to uh, just keep turning towards love, love for themselves, love for other people, because love is just so healing. And for them to just kind of find their own way. I'm not you know, I'm not here to to push any one belief 
right on to on you know on to anyone but i do believe that people can practice acceptance if they can just keep turning to love because there's really only two states there's love and fear and everything's a spectrum on that <laughs> and when and when we live our lives over in love we're much healthier happier you know life just flows much better and i know that's hard in bins withdrawal but it's certainly a goal that we can put our minds to and try to develop to the best of our ability with a broken brain. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I love that. That's in fact, the last episode we did was on anger and my responses and suggestions for handling anger were exactly the same thing. And that is letting go of those feelings, finding compassion for others and learning to love everyone, you know, without judgment and finding that, that core and that center. And that's helped me, you know, a lot through this process. And I'm, and, you know, it's hard to kind of get that message though, to some others who are so wrapped up in the pain. Yes. And how do you, yeah. how do you relay to them? Somebody who calls you and is just in, in dire straits as so many people are in this, how do you relate to them that, Hey, it will get better. And here's some things that will help, even if it seems hard right now. Well, that's exactly what I relate okay. to them. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's just it. It's that it will get better. And then I, you know, we, I hold their hand in their heart and I ask them, what can you do today to hold on? Because I find that it's better if I give them the, the, the empowerment to figure out what they need to do, as opposed to me saying, go do this, this, and this because my truth might not fit them because I would love for everybody to go out and garden because if you've read my, you know, a lot of my blog right. posts, I lived my life in my garden. In fact, I'm contemplating writing a book about my healing from benzos. And, um, and of course a lot of it will be about being in the garden, but so I don't want to shove my truth onto anybody. So I'm always asking people, what can they do in their life that day to get through the day. And then we look at areas that they can, they can turn to and rely on. I like people to come up with what I have termed in the uh, Benzo community anchors. Right. And I, you know, I encourage people to find two or three of them so that they know on their really worst moments, they have those go-to things. They can just mindlessly go get involved in that to hold on. The garden helped me. You mentioned earlier, I just wanted to say this quickly. Uh -huh. you, you were mentioning earlier about anger and compassion and whatnot. Yeah. And, and D I teach a workshop called healing with love. And I explain the nervous system to people, you know, cause postdoc I've studied social neuroscience and I'm fascinated by yeah. this one area. So I teach people what happens after birth to the brain and what happens to the nervous system that creates uh, what Rumi, you know, the wonderful Persian poet Rumi would say are all of our, our barriers to love. You know, he said, don't, your task isn't to seek for love. Your task is to seek all the barriers you have to love. So I explain in layman's terms how our brains and nervous system works so that people understand how we become kind of the people we are. And just by understanding that, you're then more able to understand other people's behavior that you don't understand or like because you realize how they got formed. And just that simple knowledge usually allows people then to be more compassionate and loving to other people because we see how we've all gotten to the places we are in our lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. I noticed from your website and from your the services you offer, you do so much of that and you have a very positive, encouraging message. Can you share with us some of, some of the services and some of the things you, you help benzo patients with? Oh, sure. Well, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. There are half-hour sessions. I found that an hour is usually too long for people's nervous system who are in the, in a dire strait. Right. So over the years I've learned a half an hour kind of seems to be, seems to be that sweet spot. So I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching there's no contracts. People just go on my website and book time with me and they call me and, and whatever they are presenting, we, you know, I help them with. And um, I offer workshops. I have recently taught two one was the acceptance workshop, and that's what we focused on, acceptance. And a lot of it was spiritually based with some neuroscience tucked in. And then I have taught a healing with love workshop 
and that was what I was just explaining to you mm -hmm. a moment ago, more of the neuroscience, but some spirituality in there as well. And then I teach a one-on-one, -on -one, um, if you want to call it a workshop, but it's a month long of coaching. And okay. that's more intense. It's called Sacred Relationship, and you get a lot of my time. It's a lot of hand-holding, and it's a much deeper dive into the neuroscience and the spirituality. And it's it's really only for people who are more healed and can be more present and focused right. and who are really, you know, really wanting to kind of get back into their life and figure it all out because it is pretty intense. And now I'm doing a, a support group. It just started two weeks ago called okay. Mornings with Jen. And I yeah, am I having that. so much fun. Oh, D. I think there's like 13 <laughs> people in the group. There's not a lot right now, but it's wonderful because I go live on Facebook and, and I said it'd be for half an hour, but most mornings we run for about 45 minutes and I answer questions and I talk Friday. I gave a cooking demonstration on how you can cook a complete meal in 15 minutes in one pan. That was how I kind of helped myself and Ben's withdrawal. And I am loving it. And I, it was a pilot, but I'm pretty sure that I will do it next month because I think we're all just enjoying it so much. I just, oh my gosh, I just love all those people in that group. We're, it's fun. It's positive. It's upbeat. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm just really enjoying and, that. And I need that so much. I, I have to, I have to admit that one of the reasons I reached out to you for this interview was um, a few different requests from my listeners. Um, several people oh. who have taken your workshops or did coaching with you and said, you need to talk to Jennifer. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, I truly love this community. I, I'm dedicated to it. I just love them. And I know how hard it is. It truly was the most brutal thing that I know I will ever experience in my life. And my yeah. recovery took years and years. And I just... I guess I kind of feel like a Marine, you know, like leave no man, <laughs> leave no man behind. And, yeah. You know, when you hear of losses in our community, it just breaks my heart because I just, I just want everybody to get I to know. the other side because I just want to tell all the listeners right now, you heal and yes. life is so precious and yes. so sweet. My life is the best it's ever been. And I, just want everybody to hold on and and get here. So I guess I'm kind of a marine, like making sure nobody falls behind. I think enemy it's a lines. great analogy. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about a couple of the issues that you've dealt with in your blog. I just kind of wanted to elaborate on them. One of the things you looked into was intrusive thoughts. Uh, you mentioned a blog post on this, and I found it <laughs> really interesting. You, you mentioned this horrible voice in my head that repeated one thought over and over, and I was like going. That's me. That's me. Oh, <laughs> can, yeah. can, you, can you talk a little bit on that and, and what some of your advice was? Sure. Intrusive thoughts, truly. Well, I had so many symptoms, but the intrusive thoughts, mostly thought for me, um, really was the thing that I had to, to battle sure. the hardest to stay alive. Um, the moment I cold turkeyed, I called it the Grim Reaper. Death just showed up at my door. Okay. And that's all I could think about. That's all I could see from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. And when I say it's every thought, like I am not exaggerating. It was horrific. Yeah. And it just tortured me and tortured me. And I couldn't get away from it. I mean, it really was. It was just awful. And finally... After, you know, after I finally stopped asking the why and sitting and feeling sorry for myself and being so miserable, I just said, you have got, you know, this isn't going to go away anytime soon and you're going to have to find a way to cope with this. So, so I finally just had to practice radical acceptance yeah. and I don't really know how to tell you, D, what the steps were for that, but just in my heart, I just had to surrender I just had to surrender and say, okay, it is what it is and just get on with my day. So I found things that, that got my hands busy um, okay. that were repetitive and rhythmic. That helped. Painting helped. I do word puzzles. I gardened. But just keeping my hands busy because my mind would often follow. But I, I just finally had to come to the realization it was not going to go away anytime soon. And I just had to learn to live with it and not give it too much energy. But definitely – 
I just want the listeners to know, please don't go head to head with your thoughts because they are no, seriously, they are such bad bullies. And no matter how often I went against them, they would come up with bigger, bigger they arguments do. that just, oh, it's terrible, right? It yeah, is. So just, it is. just make it's, peace. And it's frightening because you're trapped inside with those thoughts and there's no escape. But like oh, you know. mentioned, sometimes just keeping busy and living your life and, and pushing on eventually. I like how you said that you don't even know when it happened, but eventually it just started to slowly fade into the background. Right. Just like all the other symptoms, yeah. people ask, you know, do you wake up and it's over no. one day? And <laughs> no, I know. Right? No, it's a very, I, I remember driving somewhere and I went, oh my gosh, like I don't have derealization because every time I got behind the car, my DR got real bad. I mean, anytime I got behind the wheel. Yeah. T tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. Cause that's one I didn't have. And that's why I have trouble sharing that oh. one with some of the people. Can you, <laughs> can you tell me what that was like and how you handled that? Yeah. Um, I've never dropped acid before, but <laughs> I would imagine it would be like being on acid. Okay. It's a very surreal feeling. You're so, aware that you are aware that you're aware that you're in the world and it's it's just very surreal i felt like i was walking around in a movie or a cartoon nothing felt real um it was overwhelming everything was too bright too loud too scary uh, and you just feel trapped you feel trapped in reality and mm. trapped in your mind and it's really it would be like me trying to explain to you what childbirth is like, okay. like you, you've never, it's, it's, it's so hard. And it's also, I think at times with any benzo symptom, it's like trying to describe a new color you, you've discovered how there's no, there's no, no explanation for it. Exactly. There's yeah. no points of, um, uh, of anything that's familiar that you can describe. So all I can say is that it was really horrendous. And again, the only way I learned how to cope was one, I had to come to understand that it wasn't dangerous. I wasn't having an aneurysm or a stroke 24 right. hours a day. And I just did my best to ignore it, you know, kind of just navigate, not give it a lot of energy. But it was exhausting, as are most of the things we have to battle in benzo withdrawal. I was exhausted emotionally, physically, and spiritually and mentally most of the time. I'm sure you understand that. Absolutely. Yes. In fact, that clued me in. You mentioned childbirth, and parenting is something that comes up quite often. Again, it's not one that I have any experience in since my wife and I don't have children. But it's a question that I know comes up for a lot of parents. You have children. I know, I'm sure you work with people who have children. And handling the parenting responsibility during withdrawal has got to be incredibly difficult. How did you persevere in this, and what do you tell people who come to you and want to know how they can balance their life out? Great question. And it's one we don't talk that much about in withdrawal. So I'm really grateful that you put it out there. Sure. My four children are all adults. They were long out of, out of, I'm 61. So mm -hmm. they, they are long, they were long out of the home. Um, but it did alter my relationship with them in a very negative way. And that was, that was difficult. So it did affect my, not my parenting per se, but my you know, my place in the family, and that was hard. But anyone who's trying to parent hands-on children in the home, my hat goes off to you because it is so hard. And my best advice is to uh, lower the bar, lower your expectations. Your children don't have to be perfect. Their clothes don't have to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know, as long as they are, you know, alive and well at the end of the day, that's you've done your job. And to do your best to not to, you know, let them see you having meltdowns, try to do that privately. As long as a child feels safe, that's the key thing. That Because okay. that, safety and love are the same thing, to be honest, if you, if you look from a neuroscience point of view. So just make them feel safe. Do your best for that. And they're going to get through this and you will get through it. Yeah. And if you have the financial means, please get some outside help you know, to clean the house, to cook the food, uh, right. you know, to take care of you. But first and foremost, just, I know as moms, especially, I'm sure dads too, but I know moms, we put our children first. Mm -hmm. This time in your life, put your health first. Don't yeah. let anything come before your recovery. 
and make that your goal and just know that eventually this hard time in your family is going to come to an end. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of them. Right. Very much like the analogy when you're on an airplane, they say if you lose, if we lose air pressure right. and the, you know, put the mask on you before you put the mask on your child, because if you pass out, you can't do anything. You can't, you can't help your child. So right now, all of you parents, this is the time when you need to put that oxygen mask on yourself, that metaphorical oxygen mask, breathe deep and take really good care of yourself first and foremost, and everything else will fall into place. I love that metaphor. That's great. You, you had also written an article, uh, I think it was um, what we wish family and friends knew about benzo withdrawal. One of the things that benzo free, I, I try to always make sure we focus on is the caregiver too. In fact, we just had last week was the whole week was dedicated to the caregiver. What advice do you give, especially for people who are caring for a benzo patient? Oh, again, go back to putting that that mask on yourself first, mm -hmm. you know, that, that metaphorical oxygen mask, take good care of yourself and take breaks. And it's okay to say no. And it's okay to say no as a complete sentence. No period, full stop. You don't have to give an explanation. <laughs> it's like just, that. no, I, I, no, I can't do that right now. And I think it's really important to understand that compassion fatigue is a very real phenomenon. And that if you do experience it, and I would assume that everyone would at some point, that it doesn't make you a bad person, it doesn't make you an uncaring or unloving person, right. it just means you're a real person and you're tired. It's hard. It is just so hard to care for somebody day in and day out. So, you know, take care of yourself, take some breaks, get some help, say no. And, you know, when you have hit the wall, know that that that's normal and human and don't beat yourself up about it and and pace yourself you know this is a marathon this isn't a sprint and you're going to need a lot of resources and and you know nourishing and nourishment throughout this journey so find ways to get that done you know for yourself yeah we're getting close to our closing and i i'd like to i've done this lately i like to ask a few fun questions are you game for that Sure. Some non-related benzo questions because, let's face it, our subject matter is pretty serious, so I like to try to lighten the mood every now and then when I can. Off the top of your head, what would you say your favorite book is? My favorite book? I, oh my gosh, I don't have a favorite book. Oh, 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 well, wait, no, I, I can say that. The Prophet. I love The oh, Prophet. Oh, Khalil Gibran. Khalil yeah. Gibran. Yes, I love that. Yes, Great yes. answer. <laughs> Love that book. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, how about favorite city? Oh, gosh. Uh, Basalt, Colorado, where I used to live for three oh, my years. My home state here. Just, <laughs> yeah, I miss the Rockies so much. Oh, yeah. I didn't know you used to live here. Yeah, I lived in Basalt for three years, 2000 to 2003. Oh, wow. my, my kids were younger, much, much younger in their tweens and teens early. And yeah, then they wanted to move back to California. They missed it. But man, best years of my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Kansas City and Chicago born and raised, but then I came out here about 18 years ago and haven't left since then. So oh, <laughs> I don't blame you. It's heaven it's there. It's pretty nice. And, and the last one I have is, um, imagine it's Saturday night and you're at home, your symptoms acting up when you were still in withdrawal and you're feeling FOMO. So you, this fear of missing out. What do you feel you're missing? Where would you like to be? A club, theater, dinner? What, what would you imagine yourself doing if you could be out celebrating or doing something? You know, I'm just not much of a nightlife kind of person. Okay. I, If I felt like I was missing out on anything, it would be missing out laying like somewhere in Yosemite out oh, under the nice. stars and smelling campfire smoke and hearing nature like that's where that's my happy space. That's I like where that. I just love that. Fortunately, I don't I don't have benzo symptoms like that anymore. So I'm not missing out anymore. I can go to Yosemite yeah. if I want and do those things. Thank God. Yeah, you and me both. It's nice to be back in the real world. I, I yes. still have protracted, but I'm I'm doing so much better than I was. And I, I'm slowly, you know, step by step and getting back out into the world. And it's been pretty wonderful. Yes. And what you're going to find is that it just keeps getting better and better. Our nervous system really does go back to homeostasis. So, right. you know, when people say I'm five years out and I still have some symptoms, I'm like, I know it's okay. Yep. Just give it more time. 
you know, it because we really do eventually heal. Well, in fact, most of my recent changes were, I'm, I'm four and a half years now, we're in the last mm -hmm. six months, year. So it does happen. It just takes time. Yes, it does. It, this is a marathon. And that is one thing, not to really kick up a brand new topic here before no, we close, ahead. but I really do wish that we could get away from this 18-month you know, yeah. line in the sand saying if you go over that, you're protracted. That's just nonsense to me. It's healing takes what it takes. There is no this is normal, this is protracted. There's just healing. Right. And so many people take a long time. There's a doctor in Canada who's even talking ab about this very same topic, that it just takes quite a few years for all of those last little bit of symptoms that are hanging on, very mild and minor, but it just takes a while for it all to dissolve and go away. So I really wish we could get away from this, this uh, idea that we're protracted. We're just healing all of us. I like that. In a few sentences, this is like a last wrap-up question here. What would you tell someone who just came to you who's looking for support? In just a couple sentences, what would you say? I would say educate yourself as best as possible. Try to avoid staying on the really negative forums and groups that are focused on all the negative symptoms and do your best to find some people that you can rely on to talk to that will be positive and encouraging and they will mentor you through this but to stay away from bathing in all the negativity yeah. that is out there in the benzo community because that is not going to be helpful i i have to agree with you there that's a great point is there anything that i should have asked or anything else you would like to cover no, I think you've actually done a remarkable job. And I've been interviewed many times for my career before mm -hmm. Benzos. I was on radio and TV. And I have to say that you have been a delight and very professional. And I'm. this was just a wonderful time spent together. And I really, truly appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I have to agree. I've really enjoyed the flow of this interview. It's been just a pleasure. In fact, I could keep talking for another hour, but I have to <laughs> wind this up at some point. I, I, I first just want to again say thank you for taking the time and for all you've done for people out there. I know because of people who have told me directly how much you've meant to them. And I just want to say thank you. Please, I want to let people know that your website is benzowithdrawalhelp.com. Did I get that right this time? Yes, you did. Okay, so please check out her website. Her blog is amazing. Great resources. I've gone through it with a fine-tooth comb, and I find wonderful things there. And also the coaching and the workshops that Jennifer provides can be quite a help, I think, to people who are really struggling. So I just want to say please go check out her services and her information. And, you know, I, I can't wait till I have you back again. I would love to talk with you more and continue our conversation. Oh, I would welcome that very much just any time you just let me know i'm if i can be of service and and help that would be great well thank you jennifer and thanks for talking with today i really appreciate it you're welcome thank you again for the invite you bet take care thanks again jennifer for taking the time to speak with us today like i said in the interview it was a true pleasure to speak with her on the phone and it felt to me like two old friends chatting Thanks again, Jennifer. I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. And that brings us to our closing. So let's first just touch on our disclaimer really quick, and then we'll move into our moment of peace. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our moment of peace. This is just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I will play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of the one minute. 
And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose, and if not, continue on with your day. Please remember that you should do this exercise only if you are in a safe place. If you are driving, operating heavy machinery, or any place which is not safe to close your eyes and meditate, then please skip this closing or, or wait till you are in a safe location. Today we are going to go back to a basic relaxation meditation. Primary focus is just going to be on relaxation, on relaxing our body and our muscles and our minds. There's no mantra today. Today our focus is just going through head to toe or toe to head and feeling and being aware of any tension, of any tightness in the muscles or even any aches or pains. When you find them, take a deep breath and breathe into them. And then breathe out that stress, that tension, that tightness. Do that a few times before you move on to the next place. This may take longer than one minute, and that's fine. Just continue doing it after we end the episode. So let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time, take a deep breath in, hold, and then breathe out all your tension and stress. Now just breathe normally and slowly. And let your mind focus on different parts of your body, finding any tension and just relaxing them. Take your time, then move on to another part of your body and relax that part. We'll do this for one minute. Our next episode is episode 15, and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me, and please let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.